The Ranch Maria Association Board is to order. First uh, item of business is roll call, uh, Darlene. Here. 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 Thank you, Darlene. Uh, next item of business is public comments. The public shall have the opportunity to directly address the board on any items of interest. Public comments on items not on the agenda and within the jurisdiction of the board are welcome, subject to a reasonable time limitations for each speaker. If you wish to address the board at this time, please state your name and lot number and reserve your comments to no more than three minutes so that others may be allowed to speak. No action will be taken. Each item of business will be introduced by the president. Public comment for that item will be opened. The public will have uh, the opportunity to speak on that item. Public comment for that item will then be closed and no additional public comment will be allowed. At that time, the board will discuss the item and then take action. So um, if you're here to discuss the trail maps, which are on the agenda later, hold your comments till we get to the uh, discussion of the trail maps and you can make your public comment at that time. If you're here to address other issues, you may do so. I anticipate hearing from many uh, members with regard to the lake situation. Uh, before we address those comments, let me just say um, uh, we're all concerned about the lake. The lake was, uh, action taken out of the lake was not uh, done by RMA, it was done by CSD. Uh, they've accepted responsibility for that and they acknowledge that. Uh, Ed Krause, the general manager of CSD, has uh, uh, agreed to be here tonight and answer any questions you have. Uh, Larry Shelton, uh, Greg Vorster, Rod Hart, and myself met with uh, CSD Ed Krause and uh, Paul Stevenson yesterday for a lengthy meeting, sometimes contentious, uh, but I think overall uh, productive. Uh, we discussed what happened, what CSD's uh, response was, and where we go from here, and we're going to have some follow-up uh, meetings. With that said, um, if there's any public comments, you're welcome to step up to the podium and, and tell us your lot number and, and make your comment. As long as um, my name is Jay Solomon, lot 247. Uh, um, first off, I want to thank Rod and his crew. They were way on top of it and did an excellent job of cleaning up our lake. Uh, apparently, this isn't the first time. In my understanding, this isn't the first time that uh, this has happened on this particular lake. Um, I, I would like to see that if, if we have to add a chemical to any of our lakes, that we have a, a, a procedure um, of sampling before we add the chemicals, uh, sampling after we have the chemicals, uh, and have a written procedure for each one of our lakes so that this doesn't happen again. Um, you know, this could have been a whole lot worse. So. That's pretty much all I have to say. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am. <laughs> Hi, Mary Brennan, Lot 71. Um, I uh, ag ag agree uh, to a certain degree. I will say that CSD has looked into these things for years, and uh, 25 years ago this happened. Uh, there's been a lot of people in between <laughs> then and now. Uh, and, but I think that uh, what happened was uh, we should go to CSD meeting tomorrow. And if Ed's here tonight, well, I'm sure he'll explain as best he can. Uh, these things are unusual. Uh, some of the things that I read on the dot com uh, uh, the last day or so were so outrageous. <laughs> They're ready to hang people by their thumbs. I mean, hello, people. We all live here. Things happen. Uh, let's wait and hear the whole story. And I would like to throw in an aside to that. Is, uh, I, some of us uh, out here with 354 numbers have not been able to reach the office for the last few months. We cannot call 354-3500. And I think we put that...
through, and I hope that something has been done about it. I haven't tried the last few days, but I did call again last week. Let, let me ask you on that. Just is it? Are you a Greenfield telephone yes. or AT and T? I'm at Greenfield, and I've yeah. talked to Greenfield about it, and they said they've checked. They've, there's a number of people that this has happened to. And it's important that we reach. I, I, I'm sure Barbara has missed my calls. Right. You know, yeah, it <laughs> yeah. happens to me. And, and maybe, fortunately or not, they can't call me either. So. That's right. <laughs> there you go. There you go. No one was There's always you two sides to every story. Not necessarily. But anyhow. Mary, call me. My, my number's in the book. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. All right. <laughs> anyhow, though, I just wanted to just follow through and make sure that there's a follow through on that because that's kind of important that we're able to get through. So, uh, all right. Good all right. Thank, Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Uh, any more? Next. Yep. Um, Sandra Stadnick, lot 105. And I think one positive that's come out of this is perhaps RMA and CSD will have more um, communication about water quality issues. Um, I'm not going to be as uh, kind, I think, as Mary was, because I think CSD has had a continual um, pattern of mismanagement and lack of communication. Um, I think that if just thinking about it, if you see that uh, low volume of water, um, that's common sense that with the higher temperatures, you're going to have low water, uh, lower uh, oxygen levels. That's going to generate algae blooms. You also have the nitrates and the phosphates coming down, uh, the fertilizers coming off of the um, kind of th through the spillway there or um, from the golf course. I mean, you know those things happen every single year and you can plan for that and kind of put um, protocols in place to be monitoring that. I mean, I'm going to assume that they monitor the dissolved oxygen levels um, on a regular basis. I would like to see some of that published. I think that would be a really good idea to help people feel more comfortable that we're not looking at a situation where you have um, a dead lake, which is what we have. I mean, I think below four um, micrograms of, what was it, um, per liter of uh, oxygen is, is a dead lake. And we're essentially looking at, uh, I think it was like 0.8 were like levels that we got when we tested ourselves and did it in a, in a rigorous scientific fashion. And I think that whenever you're getting below there, below that amount and they're measuring at the spillway, um, there, should be, there should be action and there should be communication. I think the lack of communication is why you have so many people here who are really not happy. Because I think the majority are not happy with how that whole thing rolled out. Um, you know, the, uh, I think that there was obviously a problem. They put too much copper sulfate in or they put it in at the wrong interval to, um, for the, for the application, they repeated it too soon or whatever it is that happened. I mean, that's just common sense of why all those fish died and the oxygen got so low. I mean, that could have been anticipated and it should have been messaged that there was a problem, a potential problem, and that um, people understood what was going on. Um, CSD took a total lack of responsibility um, for the cleanup, I mean, I was out running around and talking to people and trying to uh, get their crew to like actually come down and do some work, um, different things like that. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a fact. I was there. Um, the um, the blue green algae, easy to identify. It's pretty. I mean, it's actually a bacteria. It's not a, not really a true algae, but I'm kind of curious to know. Um, I do think we should follow up with the toxicity test. That that should all be put out there, be very transparent, because I think that the lack of transparency is what's really bothering people. And when you read um, the comments um, by Mr. Krauss on .com, it's like, it's just, I, I really see soft peddling, and I'd like him to take responsibility because he did actually, I wish I'd written the quote down, like apologize, but then quickly put a lot of qualifiers on it as to why they weren't responsible. And I think that's unacceptable. Um, we're also talking about it's constantly referred to as a retention pond and I fail to see why that's a retention pond versus a reservoir because they're all man-made um, bodies of water. I mean, it's almost like a kind of this weird sort of slur like, well, that's really just a retention pond and it just makes you feel kind of like a second-class citizen 
uh, that, you know, oh, I live around that the Laguna Joaquin, so I'm not as important to really communicate with and to provide an environment, say, if I lived on Lake Chesbro. And that's, I mean, that's just a, that's just a feeling. But that's, I, I wonder if other people feel the same way, but we do, I, you know, I feel like um, if, if something happened elsewhere, and I see they have the um, thing that's scooping up all the vegetation out of Chesbro, I mean, that's a lot of manpower, that's a lot of work. Why don't I see people doing things down here to clean up Laguna Joaquin when I know that's going on up there? I can see the giant piles of vegetation from all the removal of um, the aquatic vegetation from that um, from that lake or reservoir. So, just you know, I, I feel like there's this uh, kind of implicit um, kind of undercurrent of a social bias in terms of taking care of this. All right, thank you. I don't want to cut you off, but I don't know if you're three minutes or up or not. But I don't want to just cut you off. <laughs> Thanks. Good afternoon, uh, Tom Matthews, uh, lot 63. Uh, I would like uh, to start simply by uh, asking those of you sitting up front, how many of you actually live on the lake that we're speaking about? Would you give me a show of hands of those who live on the lake? Just Larry's the only one. Huh? And I'd like then to ask the audience uh, the same question. Uh, if you live on the lake, would you raise their hand? My comments are going to be directed on the management of the lake or the lack of the management of the lake. I don't know of the board who has a water management degree or taken a class in water management. We've lived on the lake a number of years now. And where it should be an asset, to something we can point to our neighbors, to our friends and say, come on out, let's enjoy the lake. It's an, it's, it's an absolute eyesore. It's unhealthy. We tell the kids, don't get your hands wet. You get that fish, get rid of the fish. Now, who's responsible for all that? Are we, or do we elect you to take care of these things? I think somebody better get serious about all this water we got around us. We understand it's a problem. The, the lake is filling up with silt. We watch the, the scuba divers the scuba waders, when they go out and work on the fountains, they wade out there. We're filling this thing up. When we lived in Midtown, we had the same a situation with McKinley Park. <clears throat> it was a mess. And it was a mess to clean up, but we cleaned it up. And it, today, it remains a neighborhood treasure. Who on the board can say that that's a treasure? It's an embarrassment for years that we had to drive through that main gate. When we have people coming from other country club neighborhoods. I'm pretty disgusted with the overall management. The architectural review, it's fine for the RMA group, the RMA, but it's not cutting any slack for any of us. If we had something as dirty as that lake in our backyard, you don't think we'd be hearing from you people? You bet we would be. So I'm going to put it out to you. I think you better get serious about what you're doing. If you're not qualified, fess up to it. Get a a company or a group of uh, people who are qualified to manage a tre what, what could be a real treasure. But right now, it's really nothing more than a, a cesspool out there. It's a holding tank for runoff and all kinds of crud that's in that water. So I think you know where I'm coming from. I, I do, and I think I just... I, uh, 
I guess I want to reiterate, RMA is the homeowners association. I understand. We have no, people. yeah, we have no control over the, we're a customer of, of CSG just like you are. We, we have rights to that water, but we have no right to control, control the how water, they right? manage the, the water. The water's not yours. Down. Right. The water's not yours. Okay, you're, you're opening a door for me and I'm going to take it. A couple of years ago, my wife hears all these rocks being thrown around. And we get kids out there throwing rocks and we yell, you know, don't throw the rocks in the water. They weren't kids. They were RMA employees throwing rocks from in the back of our home into a truck, taking it over to Marietta Parkway, beautification of Marietta Parkway, using our rocks for another neighborhood. So I understand the water belongs to CSD, but just take a look at the, at the rock situation, if nothing else. There's bare spots everywhere. So anyway, I'm not going to go any further on that. That's okay. Right. Yeah, no, we'll look at it. And I'm sure Rod can look into that. Next, thanks. Thank you. My name is Greg Wheeler. I'm at Lot 99. And I live on, on the lake, on the retention pond, I guess it is. <laughs> I, uh, I reiterate what everyone else said, so I, I could reiterate, so I won't, I won't do that. But I would like to say, in reading what's been online about this, about, by people that work here or that are residents here, uh, there is some misinformation that's gone out, and I don't know the right answers to all of it. I do know that copper sulfate, if that's what's being used, is a poison. I've used it to kill fish in other places. Uh, I was involved in a, a mine Not disaster. this lake, though, right? No, 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 okay, no. Just no, 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 yeah, no. Just ask him. No, just no, that was in Alaska. I was in, I was, okay. I, no, and we fine. were killing non-native fish. Laws are different up there. Our association doesn't affect them. Yeah, no, no, it was, they were non-native fish we were trying to get rid of. But there was a big fish kill, some of you may know, uh, on the McCombie River from the Penn Mine, which is a copper mine. That leaked in there and killed thousands Lake of fish. Lake Davis killed all the fish in there. Yeah, so this is, it's not they, a surprise. They used the same that, compound there. What's like Lake Davis. They used copper sulfate. Yeah, okay. Well, so it's, it's, um, it's not a mystery that the wrong dosage would kill a fish. I also kept reading that the additive uh, took out the oxygen. Well, it took out the oxygen by killing the plant matter because, of course, when that rots, it takes out the oxygen. Um, that's neither here nor there in terms of the toxicity. It still killed the fish, but it doesn't directly kill fish by oxygen depletion. It does kill fish if you put enough in there because it attacks their liver. But I don't, I don't want to do that, all that science in there. But Got I guess in the, there. Thing that, the thing that I would say is that uh, I understand from, from everything you've said that RMA is, is not responsible, but you are our representatives, and you should be pounding mm -hmm. on those guys all the time. I plan to do that from now on. I'm one of these new residents already here to complain. I moved in in April to move into this beautiful community, which I do like, next to that beautiful lake, which immediately turned green and in the fish all day. So uh, I'm not- No coincidence, I mm -hmm. promise you. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> so uh, let's at least get the right information out there. And let's, I, I agree with, let's be honest about what's going on. You know, I, I did read what the CDC, CDC the, the water guy said, and in that condescension was, I apologize, but if there was a mistake. If there was a mistake, who didn't see the fish? It was a mistake, you know? It's, it's not, a, not an issue. It's like alternate facts, but we don't want to get into that. So, thank you. Greg? Thank you. Greg. Is that, that was, that was correct. Greg? Yes, that's right. Um, I would encourage you to get involved. I will. I was coming down here to retire. <laughs> <laughs> so was yeah. I. How are we all? <laughs> I, I guess this is my plug. We have three three openings for board positions, so yeah. we encourage people to get involved. Yeah, in three years, I think. <laughs> I don't know. There's no requirement. You just have to be a member of good standing. Yeah. My name is Alvin Summers. I am not related to Sam. We spell it the same way. Yeah, well, we lived say on that. the same street together, or maybe your son and I lived. We were on Puerto for the last 10 years. That's okay. We disavow him. Never. So, okay. so don't connect me to him. Will you take him <laughs> home tonight? Uh, I'm off. Pardon? Will you take him home tonight? <laughs> no, I'm, we're, okay. we live now in Kalina. We moved uh, about eight months ago to sort of downsize and, and get away from God knows what's going to happen uh, in the open space around Calera. Uh, I'm not good at extemporaneous, so I, if you would give me a couple of minutes, I'm going to read what, what I put down here. And it's a little bit different from what you've heard, because my concern 
is not just that lake. It's what it says about what the possibilities are with development. And so for the purposes of, of clarification of the lake water situ inflow situation um, and the, the source of the water and the output, um, the uses in order to understand how the water level got to where it is. And it, it certainly wasn't evaporation. Uh, we, we read in the, um, uh, on, on dot com that there was some sort of a, of a connection that, that had to be taken care of, some ditch that had water going from co the Consumnes River into this particular lake. I don't know what that is all about. And I think it's important that we understand what is the source of the water from this lake? And secondly, where does the water go from this particular lake? Where does the Joaquin water go? What does it supply? My concern really is that the water went somewhere and had something to do with this new construction that's going on across the, the way. You're shaking your head no, I, I don't know this. Just let him finish, where, let, him, let him go. Where, where did the water go? Perhaps the, the combination of the 50 consecutive days of, of 90 degree temperature, that helped with the evaporation, I understand that, but I don't think it's all evaporation. The problem really becomes if you're adding water usage all over the place. If we get 900 more homes here and we have another hot summer, what is going to happen to this lake? You're always going to get algae, but somebody has to take responsibility for taking care of this and also to look forward to what will be the situation when we have another 900 homes plus the commercial situation. They're going to need water. We've been to the meeting when CSD prov provided us with uh, the uh, expert's opinion of there's no problem with water, we'll never have to worry about it. Incidentally, the general manager, of course, has left, uh, and, and I'm not sure that there's any connection with that. But there is absolutely a major concern, how do we refill this lake? Where does the water come from? So I leave you really with, with four points. Who planned and monitored the diversion of the water and oversaw the health of the lake? That's number one. Number two, who requested, planned, and paid for this new piping that required shutting off the inflow of <coughs> the lake from this nice. ditch? It's, it's all only mentioned as a ditch. I've never been over there. It apparently is from the Consumnes River into some area behind the country, the country store and then it gets pumped. I don't know. Uh, number three, was there an alternative to keeping the lake full? Simple question. Was there an alternative to keeping it healthy? And lastly, what proof do we have that the new commercial areas and the new developments are going to have adequate water and what will prevent it, them from pulling the water again from this gorgeous lake that we have. As I said, we've only been here eight months, but we've been in, in the community for 10 years. We love it. It was devastating to see what was out there. My wife, by the way, was the one who reported this to the CSD at 8.45 on Friday night, because she took her walk around and came back almost in tears. The stench, the dead fish, unfortunate. But it's happened, but there are questions and, f and futures that need to be addressed. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Maybe to try to take a stab, I'm not going to take a stab at the larger water issues, but Ed's here. Maybe he could explain the, the, the how the Laguna Joaquin figures into the, the 
the irrigation ditch and, and what's well, going I, on? I have that. quite a few clarifications and, and information I can provide to the community. And so, just so, just I guess, this is Ed Krause, he's the general manager of the community interim. services district, the interim general manager. Interim general manager, <laughs> back again, that's right, thank you. <laughs> but first, I want to agree with the community that losing fish is, is horrible. And losing fish that we restocked in the lake is horrible. And I don't ever want it to happen again. And how can I do that? I'm here to rebuild the trust in the community on behalf of the CSD. And I will do that by acknowledging when we make mistakes, that we own up to them, we hold ourselves accountable, and we do, don't do any finger pointing. And personally, what I'm going to do is what I'm doing here tonight. I'm going to communicate with transparency. I'm going to evaluate our mistakes. I'm going to change our procedures and policies. And I'm going to move forward and make progress so that it doesn't happen again. Now I have some clarifications because there's a lot of misinformation in the community, past, present, and probably going to happen in the future. So I want to try to nip it in the bud. So the first is the fish kill. The perception is, is that as soon as we put algaecide in the lake, it killed the fish. And that isn't the case. We applied the algaecide August 3rd and August 4th. And the fish started dying a week later, August 11th, 12th, and the 13th. And I want to make another point. We treated that same location June 30th in preparation for July 4th. And we didn't kill any fish. There was an um, assertion or misunderstanding that we overdosed. And we've been dosing this area for, as Mary indicated, many years. And we haven't had a fish kill until this last weekend. We only dose it to kill the algae in that little cove in front of RMA's irrigation pump station. And that dosage is only sufficient to kill the algae in that area. We don't dose the entire lake. We don't put enough chemical in there to kill algae 1,200 to 2,000 feet down near the spillway. It's only focused on the area near the pump station. In fact, we follow the recommendation that it says not to treat more than one half of the lake. And the reason for that is the fish understand and realize what's happening in that area when we dose it, and they scoot away. So the recommendation of the manufacturer is not to treat more than half the lake. And that little cove over there is roughly two or three acres. The entirety of the lake is 25 acres. So we're only dosing perhaps less than one-tenth or 10% of the lake. There is a, a concern that the CSD staff wasn't present. And that's a misunderstanding, and, and I need to clarify. Um, Friday, we received an email that fish were dying. Our staff went out Friday and worked Friday morning and afternoon collecting fish. We had plans to come in on Saturday, and we did. We had two staff here at 7 o'clock in the morning collecting fish. We had one other operator come in later in the morning to flush the fire hydrants. We had direct communication with our supervisors throughout the day. In fact, one of our plant operators is a supervisor here. So he had all the authority in his power to spend money to ask for additional resources. In fact, we did have two additional plant operators that were on site and were available if called and if needed. Our two um, workers worked with RMA on a boat. RMA staff was a driver, and our two utility workers picked up the fish. We shared responsibility to dispose of the fish. We took some of the fish back to our uh, treatment plant. We disposed of them and came back. 
Those two individuals worked until 6.30 on Saturday. On Sunday, a supervisor came out at 7 in the morning and stayed till 12 in the afternoon, picking up fish and patrolling the perimeter of the lake. I came out at 12.30 on Sunday, stayed, coordinated with staff as needed, um, provided information to RanchMarinated.com and was available and sent memos to my directors. On Monday, we had staff patrolling the perimeter of the lake and they took additional dissolved oxygen samples in the evening. Security was available as needed, but it was a water issue. So for them, unless they're called by the water department and they need additional staff to help with traffic control or, or looky-loos, security is, is going to let um, the uh, water staff take care of it. I'm sorry I'm taking some, so much time, but I think it's important that I get some no, of these no misunderstandings taken care of. Um, there's a question about the CIA ditch construction. And that ditch was originally constructed in 1922. The Granley's Dam, just up, upstream, was built in 1922. And that ditch was to provide water to downstream ranchers. And some of those downstream ranchers still have the ranches in existence and still have claim to that water down that ditch. But I was curious, like you, why would we start a project in the dead of summer? Doesn't make sense to me. But when you look at this project in total for all of the other projects related to the Murrieta Gardens project, you start to understand that it isn't always that simple. The Murrieta Gardens project is required to do work on Highway 16. I believe they have to widen it and put an entrance into their property off Highway 16. To do that, you need to get a Caltrans encroachment permit. And that takes almost forever. But they finally got that permit. And that permit actually set bookend constraints on the schedule for doing work in the CIA ditch. The CIA ditch is being piped at the request of the CSD, paid fully by the developers. But it's going to benefit everybody in this room because any water that's lost from that ditch is going to be conveyed to Laguna Waukee. So there's going to be less stress on the river. But getting back to the schedule, you can't start work on any work in the Caltrans right away unless and until you have a pre-job meeting with the encroachment permit engineer. That didn't take place until the middle of June. So that's the earliest they could start. But on the other hand, there's been suggestions that they delay the project. Well, the other part of the permit requires stopping all work in the, rut, the highway right-of-way by November 15th. So they've got to finish that work by November 15th. But before they can do that, they need to realign and provide drainage south of the right-of-way. So they've got to do that work first before they can work on the actual highway. But even before they can do that, they have to start and complete the CIA ditch. So that was why the CIA ditch was planned to start work at the tail end of June. So there's um, some questions and thoughts that it's not very well thought out. Well, that's not necessarily the case. The CSD and the RMA and developer have had constant communications since the beginning of June through July, through in fact yesterday, on how we can move forward and plan for the construction of the CIA ditch. We met. The flows in the CIA ditch going into Laguna Joaquin were going to be continued until the last possible second, which it was when we stopped uh, the flows on June 27th. We had the lake full at that time. RMA agreed to back off their irrigation from daily to three times a week. The CSD committed to begin our hydrant flushing program that we put on hold and suspended during the drought to help fill it back up. 
We planned on a four to six week schedule of construction. We were delayed in the beginning because we had water flowing back because of leaky valves and uh, we needed to have the ditch dry so they could be in construction. And it took us about 10 days, so we lost about 10 days in the beginning. So that pushed the schedule even further. So we're right now probably heading into the seventh week. We are working with the contractor and our staff and valve replacement to try to complete it the end of next week and get river water flowing back into Laguna Waukee. There's a, a, a misunderstanding about whether we actually gave water to the developer. And I've heard that before. And this water is CIA ditch water. And that ditch water, when it flows into the lake, is obligated and stored on behalf of the ranchers downstream. They have a water right to store water in Laguna Joaquin for 30 days, temporary storage. The amount of the water they can store in there is 130 acre feet. That's roughly 100% of the 125 acre feet that's nominally in the storage of Laguna Joaquin, probably when it was, early con when it was constructed early, earlier. It's 25 acres, surface area maybe five, six feet deep. Who knows how deep it is now with silting. And yes, we tried to release water from the CIA ditch because the downstream ranchers needed that to irrigate their crop. We tried to do that in the middle of July. We opened a valve and released water down the side ditch. Unfortunately, no water got to the rancher. So we immediately stopped and plugged that valve, and that valve has been plugged ever since. So there are no releases of water out of Laguna Joaquin. The only use of the water is for RMA irrigation and evaporation. And it's hard to believe we're down to about 32 inches below the spillway. We pop it back up a couple, a couple inches here and there with hydrant flushing, but that's where it is. And that's probably where it's going to stay until we can get more water into Laguna Joaquin. Ed, can I interrupt just a second? Because I, yes. I missed one of the numbers you, you put out. I was at 125 acre feet that, that the, uh, the ranchers downstream all, uh, have rights to. They have was rights that what, to was store, that what your number was? No, they have rights to store 130, 130 acre, feet, thank you. acre feet for 30 days rolling out, rolling storage, temporary storage. It's riparian water that flows down the river. And riparian water rights, are only you're only allowed to store that for up to 30 days for beneficial use. There were some questions about Laguna Joaquin and its purpose. Well, it is an asset to the community for storage and aesthetics. But the primary purpose, the underlying primary purposes are three. First, it's the CSD detention water quality basin. No getting around <coughs> it. Water drains from the developed lands and from the undeveloped lands. The second is the CIA temporary storage for downstream uses. The third is for RMA irrigation. The fourth ancillary use is aesthetic view corridor purposes. But there are four sources of water. The first is storms, direct rainfall in or runoff off of the undeveloped lands that bring silt and it clouds, clouds the water. And then there's runoff from urban areas that bring it their own pollutants, oil and gas. The second source is over irrigation water by the residents. That brings fertilizers and nutrients to help algae grow. The third is the CSD has a water right to wheel water in for RMA irrigation into the lake. It's a nominal amount. And the last but the biggest is the temporary storage of CIA ditch water in Laguna Joaquin. So what really killed the fish? I know I put algaecide in it. Cause and effect, finger points directly at me that the algaecide killed the fish. But I'm not 100% sure. But right now, I will accept responsibility and say that we killed the fish by putting that algaecide in there. But when you look at where we put it in and where the fish were dying way up at the spillway, I, I just don't know. But 
I'm going to make it right. And how am I going to make it right? As I said earlier, we're going to evaluate our communications plan inwardly, up and down, and outwardly. We're going to evaluate our emergency response plan, specifically as it relates to fish kill. We really don't have an emergency response plan for this eventuality. Nobody ever thought it would happen, and now all of a sudden it happened, so we're going to go back and, and come up with our emergency response plan. We're going to evaluate our algae treatment procedures. We're going to look at alternative products. We're going to look at the dosing, the timing, and the locations. We're going to do water quality testing before and after the application, as recommended. We're going to consult with outside experts, lake management companies, product suppliers, UC Davis professors, and any other residents in the community that want to step up and help us. We are committing funds to restock the lake. I understand a year ago we spent $2,800 as a community. CSD is going to step up and pay $2,800 or we're going to restock the lake. Hopefully we get some uh, smaller catfish that can grow on midge flies, um, get some more sport <laughs> fish in there. We're going to accelerate work on the CIA ditch to try to get it finished by the end of next week. And if we don't, we're going to seriously consider buttoning up any project that we need to complete, get water flowing down in, into the ditch. That, that ditch is outside the right of way, so we can work on that after November 15th. And we're going to work on it if we have to later in the season. But we want to try to focus on getting water down the ditch. And lastly, we're going to work with RMA and the community on setting expectations on, on the lake. Really understanding what it is and what it could be and how we get there, both as the CSD, the RMA, the community at large. So in the end, the bottom line takeaway, and you can take it to the bank, the CSC, CSD is here as part of the community. We are committed to making it right, and to the best of our ability, we're going to prevent it from happening in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Ed, Thank I, I actually have a couple of things I'd like to uh, discuss with you briefly, or just add to your, your comments. Uh, first of all, uh, the timing on how uh, copper sulfate actually impacts the, the, the life and the health of the stream is a 68-day lag time, which is exactly where the fish kill was in your, in your scheme for uh, application and kill. Um, secondly, car, car, carp is stupid, so they don't necessarily always go where they should be going. They tend to go where they shouldn't be. Um, so I'm not sure that that analogy of only getting dead fish in one spot is, is, is really uh, too heavy there. Um, but one of the, uh, you and I have talked, and, and one of the things I'm as much concerned about as anything else, in addition to where we're going, and I think you have a great plan, and I applaud that, uh, but the response, I think the response was critical, and I, I, I think we, we failed miserably in, in our ability to respond to the situation, even when we knew what to do and didn't have necessarily the resources or the manpower to do it. But for just a matter of clarification, um, the, 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 the impact that CSD made on Saturday when the fish kill was, was at its strongest and needed the most assistance uh, was two people with plastic bags and nets to try and pick up 1,200 or 1,000 uh, fish floating in the middle of a lake. And there should have been some mechanism in place so that they could get additional resources to really do what they needed to do with the lake. And that's where I think one of the big deficiencies is. Okay. Right, anything else? Thanks, Ed. Thank Ed, you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Appreciate, appreciate, it. appreciate it. Any other public comments? Well, you don't get a do-over, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's all been very interesting. Basically, I, I spent a lot of years on the CSD board, as well as you fellows have done on your, or the RMA board. 
I think that we're going back to the CSD owning the water and RMA owning the land is dated. I think we ought to really get together, you two boards, and decide. RMA, we're all members of RMA, we're all part of CSD. That's fine. But when you come in the lake, you, I mean, you come in our gate, the lake is what you see. It's what we're proudest of coming in. Uh, the RMA does a beautiful job of taking care of the landscaping and so forth. That lake has got to look good. CSD does not care as much about that as RMA does. RMA make every effort to work with CSD and do the legalities that are necessary to take over the control of the lake. You're the ones who could get out here the fastest. You're the ones who can take care of it. Um, uh, the water can just, you could order more water. We might have to pay for it, but that's the, that's the point. I think that between CSD owning that part of the water, no, let them own, own the water that we drink. This is a drainage ditch, and that's what it's always been. Uh, and it has other, as Ed said, other, other causes too. But I really think you should look into that and consider it as, a, as a, a good possibility of taking over the control of that lake. You're the ones we want to complain about when the weeds are growing. We're, you're the ones that we will, and we have to go through CSD. Um, please, consider doing that. And, and I think it's, it's, it would be well worthwhile if RMA controlled that lake. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. I, do, I will t I say we have had discussions, especially yesterday, <laughs> with CSD along those lines about the aesthetics of the lake and and we're promised and we'll have continuing follow up in the following weeks, months and we'll address that. It's unfortunately as you probably know it's not a there's not an easy solution, easy answer, but but we'll work on it is see if we can get that because I think we agree and I know uh, Larry here agrees that it's way beyond and, and he gave them their two cents yesterday, too, <laughs> of, the, of the quality of the lake. So any other public comments? You have to come up to the podium and give your... Well, you still have to come up to the podium and... Uh, no questions are allowed, sorry. No, I go. think this is for... What, your name and your lot? I'm Diana number? Summers. And, and I don't know my lot number. We've been there seven months. It's on Colina. Okay. Fourteen. There you there go. There you go. Your neighbors all know. <laughs> now I know my lot. What's your last name? The same as you. That's what I thought. He doesn't know his either, so don't worry about it. He's only been here 20 years. We must be related. We have the same color hair. <laughs> you don't want to be related to this. Yeah. Guy, so okay. So my question is to Larry Shelton. And, and I thought the presentation was, was excellent from CSD. And he had a very logical argument for me that, you know, if they only treated that small portion of the lake, then it should not have killed the fish. And logically, it sounds like the lack of water and the heat then possibly killed the fish. So we're back to where's the water, you know, and how Diane, do you get the water in there? Yeah, it, it actually is a combination of things. And, and the reason that, that the lack of water is, is significant is it's just physically the volume that the fish have to live in is half as much as it would be if it was full. And also, the temperature of the water is affected more readily by the air temperature when there's a smaller body of water. So the water temperature this year is higher than it was last year. Mm -hmm. Even though last year we had similar conditions, it was hotter and the water level slightly lower. All of that are going to have an effect on what happened there. Not just the algicide, but, but here's the issue about that. It's, it's, it's dissolved. It dissolves in the water. It moves with the current. It doesn't stay in one spot. It could be applied in one spot. But we measured 0.7 dissolved oxygen completely across the lake at the spillway uh, and CSD did, not me, not we, but CSD did, and point, point 0.7 is dead, absolutely dead, and there's no oxygen in the water. That's about as close to zero as you can get without getting there. And so the, the algicide was all over the lake. It wasn't just where they put it. And, and in addition to that, fish don't stay in one spot. They, they could have um, been subjected to the zero 
uh, oxygen there and then uh, swam somewhere else and died. The, the, most of the fish, over 50% of the fish, were carp. Carp stay on the bottom, and they were big carp, and they needed lots of oxygen. The further down you go towards the bottom, the less oxygen there was in the lake. So those are all contributions to the fish kill, but the catalyst had to be the algicide because it was a specific, specific time frame from the time it was applied till the effect on the fish. There was, no, there was nothing else that occurred there. There was nothing else that added to that at a time frame that would have been significant to cause a thousand fish to die. So the number of fish in the shallowness of the water alone would not have created no. I mean, we might, have, we might have lost a few. We wouldn't have lost 80% of the fish in the lake. Okay. And, and it was the, we've, we've monitored not only CSD, I say we, I have the ability to monitor dissolved oxygen also. We, between them and I, we have monitored the lake tremendously since the, 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 the problem, not before or not during. But since then, we've monitored this, the ability of the lake to sustain life, and it is slowly returning to something that would maintain uh, a typical environment for this lake. But for two and a half days, it did not. It did not have enough oxygen in the entire lake to sustain life. I was confused by um, the capacity of the lake. Maybe I misunderstood this, but the ranchers actually, they have a right to the total capacity of that lake. Am I wrong there? It was 130, I think you wrote it down. And 130 the, acre feet of water. And the lake itself is 125? So that means they get the whole lake. They stack it. Re recognizing that the in the normal conditions, the lake should be refed with water constantly. The, the, the lake doesn't just get full and, and there's no more water coming into it. The, the ditch, the CIA ditch, should be replenishing the, the lake supply. The farmers don't need the, the, that kind of volume all at once. They're talking about over an irrigation season. So up to this point, the replenishment has worked, and it's simply because they cut it off for this length of time for the pipes. I mean, in the past years. Right. Well, as, as, it, as we've pointed out, as, as people pointed out, this happened again, 20, it happened also 25 years ago. But in that 25 years, there has not been, to my knowledge, any more than a bucket full of fish that's died from from the effect of, of living in this lake. And the lake has not gone down in No, capacity. and, and um, people have talked about the, the mud in the bottom and the, and the fact that maybe when it was made it was six feet deep and now it may only be four because of all the mud. Most of that, most of that what, you, what you see that's brown out there is not sediment. Mm -hmm. It's algae. It's floating algae. And that's what's turned the lake brown. And most of what you have in the bottom is algae. There's probably a good foot of really concentrated algae in the bottom of the lake. It's pretty shallow because the egrets are walking out. <laughs> it, it's it's, it, 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 it's very close. To, it's very close to about three feet deep in most cases right now. Okay. Um, but in, in, in addition to that, uh, uh, copper sulfate, the way it works, it it, it it actually takes oxygen out of the water, but it it makes the brown algae that's there colloidal into a ball, very small, maybe the size of a pea or something. But then as that dies, it falls to the bottom from, from the weight. And so all this has been accumulating there from adding chemicals to it. So, so what, I'm sure you've got at least a foot of, of algae in the bottom. You may, may have some sediments, but since I've lived here, I've not seen an awful lot of sediments coming down. The only two inflows this have, well, it, the pipe, CSA ditch, but there's two arms of the lake that feed water and when there's runoff, I've not seen a lot of sediments come down those. So I'm not thinking that there's a huge amount of sediments. They will accumulate, sure, over 40 years, but I'm thinking the majority of the bottom of this lake or the majority of the lake is probably just simply brown algae. And it's okay to keep that in there? I mean, well, it, it, I mean, it, it's, it's, not harm, it's not harming anything other than the fact that it's a, making it a pain in their butt to, to try and, and, and mitigate anything. It's, a, it's, it's difficult to clean it up. It's difficult to, to uh, control it. It's difficult to 
get life to exist when you've got a lake that's a third of the way full of algae. And, 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 and I know people have, have heard the discussion, and pardon me for taking so much time, but I know people have heard the discussion that we need to drain the lake and, and dredge it. Uh, that would be extremely expensive. That would be the ideal solution, but what we're going to dredge out of there is muck and organic compound that we could actually probably pump out a lot cheaper if we just pump the bottom, if we just run a pump around the bottom and sucked it up. Uh, there, there, there's been an estimate floating around here, which is probably a pie-in-the-sky estimate, but it's estimated that to dredge the lake would be about $3 million. And to pump it out? Is I don't have a clue. And I'm not even sure how accurate the three million is. I'm just, it, it, it's going to be, it will be expensive. I, and that was the, the, the reason to mention that. Uh, Hang on. If you're going to ask a question, no I, offense, sir. I really thought I gotta, only had one, one, so I'm going to go sit down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other public comments? <laughs> Come on. I'm still Greg Wheeler. I'm still Lot 99. Uh, this is really quick. But first of all, I just want to say Larry is speaking the truth. I really appreciate that. I think the whole board, as far as I know, uh, has, has done a good job. I do. I, I think that he just the, moved here, right? The, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you, can go, you can go apologize to him uh, later. I, I, I just paid him to go there at once, yeah. not the second time. Well, I would, I would say this in front of Ed. I see that he's gone on everything. I, w I want to caution everybody about what he just did. I mean, they, made you doubt whether or not the fish were killed by his chemicals. It is six to eight days before that reaction, partly because it kills the algae within the rot and takes up part of the oxygen as well. Um, and then he also uh, made it sound like, well, you know, fourth on the, or fifth on the list was aesthetics. And that may be the way they work, but we've got to change that attitude. Because think, if, if you can't think of just how much you enjoy being there, think about what your property is going to be worth. Who wants to buy a, something on a mud hole, you know? Um, so. so I thought he very, I thought the, the second part where he talked about, you know, what they were going to do sounded really good. I hope that they do that. But the first part. We'll, we'll hold them to that. Yeah, yeah. And hold him to, let's do some science. If he really doesn't know how that chemical works, then he shouldn't have been here talking about it. I mean, you can find it online. Go look it up. It's easy. So. Well, I would encourage, and I'm not trying to cut off public comments, but we have a whole other meeting, too, and this is getting into the really CSD issues that should be addressed to the CSD board, but you had a question there. I don't want to cut you off. Just quickly, um, we, you know, we talked a lot about DO, but what about uh, alkalinity, pH, and you said water temperature, and you told me, pardon me? Alkalinity makes a difference. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. And, um, yeah. Yeah. The, and something else. The, the, <laughs> the, <laughs> I'm old. I don't remember things past 30 seconds. I, I, I personally have not checked the alkalinity. The pH is, is in an acceptable range for the lake. It, it's always ran um, up uh, a mid to upper 8, uh, 8 point something range. And that's in the alkaline side of pH. It's not acidic. And, and that's typical for that lake and is typical for most natural lakes. So I, I have not been too but concerned with that. Uh, temperature, temperature has been a significant factor. And one of the things that I've, I've worked with on rod oh, is trying to maintain the temperature at, at, at as low a level as we can with using the pumps and various things. And that was the guide as to whether the midge flies are uh, hatching or not. Uh, the larvae is hatching. That was the, the temperature thing is that. Um, and uh, I, I do know that solids, the solids are within, within the typical range you'd expect of a lake that gets run off from springs and, and natural uh, mountains. So yeah, w everything else is really, th that I can personally monitor is really within acceptable range. And, and normally the pH, or normally the dissolved oxygen is also. We, have good, we had good dissolved oxygen until about June when the temperature started rising and the oxygen started dropping and then obviously as we got really bad and the algae took over, we, that dropped the, the oxygen levels. But again, not, in, not to a dangerous level, but that's where we are now. And, and by the way, I want to thank the public for their, their uh, performance here tonight. Even just sitting here is significant. Yeah, do we have any other public comments? I want to echo then Larry's thanks to 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 the members one for for you know being polite and professional. 
<laughs> at the address and and, uh, and 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 the decorum of tonight's meeting. I really I really do appreciate it. I think we've had a good discussion that could have dissolved and gone a different way, and I'm glad it didn't. And that's a that's um, that's a benefit. And uh, you know, I applaud I applaud you as the members for, for coming here. Even you know. I know you guys are all upset, and I see Myrna there, and I know she can give me an earful any time she wants. So I, I, I appreciate, I appreciate that. So any other public comments other than than, than trails? Don't don't go away. The trails could get interesting. Yeah. Please. So, um, or other agenda items. Okay. Hearing none, I'm going to close the public comment section. Um, we'll take, I, if people want to leave, I'll, we'll take like a one minute, two minute break. So people can quickly exit and then we can continue with the meeting. Greg, <laughs> 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 He wasn't talking to you. <laughs> I think he's here for me. Yeah, it wasn't for, for you guys. Yeah. Okay. Have a good evening, right? Yeah, that's great. Hey. Well, if I walk out that door, I ain't coming back. Yeah. <laughs> Conversation, you can do it out the yeah, outside. Come on, put that gavel again. Come on. Do you like that? I can do the big one too. Huh? I have learned. This is the Cheryl back. All right, thank you. Next item of uh, business is the consent calendar. Consent calendar items are considered routine and will uh, be approved by one motion. There will be no discussion of the items unless the director requests an item uh, to be removed. Uh, I, I have a question, but I don't want it removed. Can I do that? Okay, well, let's do get a motion in a second first. And then okay. Nobody wants an item to so be removed. removed. Okay, we got a motion to approve the consent calendar. We have a I'll second. second it. Okay, motion and a second. Mr. Mabey. Uh, Colleen, it's on the uh, accounts receivable aging. Um, if my math is somewhat correct, it dropped <laughs> by about almost $7,900. Is that correct? That's kind of a large drop, isn't it? You're saying from month to month? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. That's all I have. Huh? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? 
Hearing none, all in favor of approving the consent calendar say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passage unanimously. Uh, next item of business is the minutes of July 18, 2017. We have a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. We have a second. Second. And do we have any uh, comments, corrections? Panels? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes for July 18, 2017, say aye. 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 I'm going to abstain. And, abstain. Uh, Sam and on, uh, Alex abstain. abstain. Come on. Okay, Everybody else votes aye. aye. <laughs> there, are no, there are no cookies in these minutes. <laughs> The uh, that comment I shouldn't shouldn't say it, but it's president's president's uh, reports up next uh, in the board in executive tonight. We approved the minutes and attached as an addendum, which was a re recipe that we <laughs> <laughs> took out. So that's where that comment came from. Anyway, um, so anyway, tonight it's executive session. We we approved the minutes absent the addendum, <laughs> uh, legal invoices, and reviewed some legal issues. Uh, we also approved collection, collection action against APN 073-0870-015-0000. And that's the end of uh, the President's report. Uh, General Manager's report. Uh, Mr. Spych, if you could uh, move out of the way, we're already uh, ready. <laughs> and let me, and before Greg gets going, let me just tell you how this is going to go. Greg will give his uh, presentation on the trail system. Did you want to allow comments first? No, I'll let you make your presentation, and then we're going to open it up for public comments. Then we'll close public comments, and then the board will have a discussion. So that's how we're going to do this. Go ahead, Greg. Okay, first I'm going to read from my prepared script here, then I'll go over the exhibits. Uh, the Parks Development Agreement requires landowners to develop and upon completion grant to RMA at no cost to RMA a system of pedestrian and bike trails constructed to standards and specifications as approved by the Parks Committee and consistent with state and federal regulations. And that paragraph is taken from the, from the Parks Development Agreement. And so it's not something I made up, it's, it's actually from the agreement itself. Uh, the proposed RMA master trail plan attempts to follow the conceptual exhibit E, which is the exhibit to the Parks Development Agreement depicting all trails. In November 2001, the Parks Committee approved the exhibit E as a trail system. This proposed RMA master trail plan would replace exhibit E once approved by the Parks Committee. Also in February of 2003, the Parks Committee adopted a specification for all street trails requiring a 12 foot wide path which two foot shoulders constructed with six inches of base rock and two inches of asphalt. Rancho North has already submitted a proposed trail plan to the county. One component of their proposed plan is 17 and a half miles of natural dirt trails, which is not part of the current Exhibit E. Uh, the master plan being proposed by RMA incorporates the 17 and a half miles of natural dirt trails shown on the devel developer's proposed map. The approximate mileage of paved off street trails is six and a half miles also included in the proposed master trail plan are on-street pedestrian bike trails. Once the master plan is adopted by RMA and its Parks Committee representatives are instructed to vote in favor of the map, it will next be presented to the CSD board for approval and direction to the other one, one Parks Committee representative. Next, the Parks Committee will take action on it and it will be presented to Sacramento County. So now let me kind of explain what I just said. Uh, I've got three exhibits up here. Uh, the first one is the uh, conceptual trail plan that was formulated in 1990 as part of the Parks Development Agreement. The second map is the plan submitted by Rancho North to Sacramento County uh, as the proposed trail system uh, for our community. The third is the proposed master plan that I'm asking the board to adopt tonight. And so if this map is adopted, uh, the board would direct its representatives, which we have two of the five votes on the Parks Committee, on how to vote on this map. Uh, next month we plan to take this map to CSD and ask their Parks representative member to also vote in favor of this map. Uh, then we'll go to the Parks Committee and have a vote on it at, at the Parks Committee, because the Parks Committee has a final say on what that map looks like. Um, 
And I mentioned, uh, and so basically this, what we're asking uh, in this plan is that there be a uh, paved trail around Lake Calero, then it cuts over down to Lake Chesbro. Uh, currently there's already a paved trail on this side of Chesbro. Uh, a new trail would go on the opposite side of Lake Chesbro and connect to the existing trail. Uh, then the trail would come down to Lake Clementia. It would flow on both sides of Lake Clementia, uh, then cut down to the Kasumnas River. Uh, there is uh, a little spur of it that goes over here in this, into this area. And then the 17 and a half miles of trail that I'm talking about are natural trails, which are existing uh, single track uh, dirt trails, which you'll see the, uh, uh, a lot of hikers out there using them. Uh, 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 trail bikes use them and this red line depicts those natural dirt trails and there's uh, 17 and a half miles of the dirt trails and six and a half miles of the paved trails in addition to that uh, the map also has uh, on street uh, bike pedestrian trails um, we've got less of those trails we have the one coming down to Clementia and going across the dam we have one going over towards the fairways, and we've got one uh, going from Claro uh, down to the uh, Lake Clementia area. Uh, then we also have one coming off Porto going down to the, the park side at Lake Claro. And so those would be the uh, on-street bike pedestrian trails. And I guess the difference between, I guess, our trail and what the developer has presented is, is that they're showing uh, a, a much more on-street trail and we're showing more off-street trail. And so his proposal would be less of the uh, paved trails going around the lakes and more of the trails running along adjacent to the road, uh, roadways. And so I guess that's my presentation. Any questions? Well, let's open it up to uh, public comments. And does anybody wish to make a comment? Going once, going twice, hearing none? Oh, we have John. <laughs> So um, I, I think one of the things that after the John, you need to introduce yourself in your lot number. John here. Sullivan, <laughs> lot three fourteen, Rancho Marietta Properties, Casunas River Land. Thanks, John. Um, I think one of the issues that um, after we went through the trail walk uh, earlier this year was the idea that we would have a well-publicized um, parks meeting or community meeting to get input on the trails, both in-road, uh, proposed by Exhibit E, and the off-road trails that are described more in this exhibit than they are anywhere else. <clears throat> Remembering that the Exhibit E is conceptual, and until there are maps, final maps, not tentative maps, adopted, the, everything is just conceptual. And that's what the uh, Parks Agreement says. That's what Exhibit E says. It's conceptual. And these things, depending on where the lots end up being in the villages, the eight that are depicted here, um, things will move around. So getting fixed, particularly over here on the east side of Clementia, with a paved trail on a uh, lake, having the, this trail paved on this side, it's a no-go. It's a water quality issue. So you can't, go, you can't go there because there's no way to deal with all the drainage and have a paved trail on the east side of that lake. The rest of them are, I think we've talked about them with Greg and everybody a number of times. They're reasonably close to what we would um, agree are the paved trails, the in-street bike and pedestrian, and then the ones around the lake I think we've kind of come to consensus on. So can't really go down that road of adopting this, otherwise it's just going to get changed uh, later on when the final maps come forward. So I, I would suggest that we do what was discussed with CSD and what we asked uh, Martha and 
Greg to do, and that's to have a well-publicized meeting to discuss all the potential uh, benefits of the trails, both in the road, around the lakes, and the multi-purpose uh, trails to, to see that we can come to a consensus. Because uh, we worked with MTS on locations uh, for this map and for this map, and they've changed somewhat because of where our subdivision proposed uh, lots are going to go and where the open space is or isn't that has moved around, and that's still in uh, development. So, thank you. Thank you, John. Any other public comments? Yes, sir, come on up and state your name and lot number. Okay, perfect. So, I'm Patrick Salo, lot 1160. Um, I'm a fairly new resident, a year and a half now. Um, and I actually haven't seen any of this yet. This is all relatively new. Maybe it's being announced tonight. But, but I wanted to express, you know, one of the reasons why me and my family, we actually moved to Rancho Marietta. It's because of the trails and it's because of the lakes. So, you know, in the year and a half that we've been here, we've enjoyed all kinds of great sunsets and walks around lakes and, you know, over at the, the Parkway Trail. Um, it, it's an awesome treasure that most communities don't have having this access to nature right in your backyard. So whichever direction this goes, I understand, you know, a lot of this land isn't part of RMA that, you know, the in this case, John and the devel developers own, you know, so we have maybe a, a certain degree of um, possibilities for what the land can be used for. You know, I, I would really urge RMA and, you know, potentially this will come out in public comments as well to, to try and retain as much of the trail system as we can and you know hearing all of the, the the talk about paved trails i think that's great it makes it more accessible for many more people but just simply keeping you know the more groomed dirt trails would be awesome so you know those are my comments all right thank you any other public comments all right hearing none we'll close the public Comments and any board discussion? Board motions, anything? Um, I, I, I think a couple things. Um, I get that the Exhibit E is conceptual, um, but I also agree that we need to move forward. If uh, plot lines are going to move, they're going to move. Um, I don't have any heartburn over any of the dirt trails uh, that are on private property. Um, we don't own them. Uh, for the most part, the developer didn't ask for them. So however they move, that doesn't really affect what RMA does, if that makes sense. But I think what's in front of us is to move this forward. At the end of the day, whether we can get a trail behind uh, Clementia or not, um, somebody will make that decision for us and we move on. But that doesn't hold up what we need to do today to, to move it forward on what what our system is and and i think our system is very close with a couple of exceptions to what the developer already ahead of us submitted to to the county we just need to get something submitted uh, that represents rma i i totally agree i think we've uh, we've beat this to death well let's not bring we've had enough dead <laughs> <laughs> it's not floating yet but <laughs> and, and uh, I, I can do it. I will say that the idea behind this map and the developer's map too is it preserves a lot of those dirt trails that otherwise really don't have a legal right to exist out there. Well, yeah, they were anyway, they were built so, there without permission, so, et cetera, et cetera. But it so, doesn't affect RMA. Yeah, it doesn't. That, ultimately, it doesn't affect right. RMA as an association, corporate entity. Right. Certainly, it affects the members. Correct. Of, of and I think I think I think initially also we wanted to have you know some pavement around the lake so that they would be more accessible to to more people. Um, so I think you know, but with the idea that there would be movement of some sort at, eventually to accommodate different parts of the terrain that where that might not be suitable. Um, but at least we would have a, a start. We would have a a conceptual idea of what we want to have out there. So I, I think we should be moving forward with this. With that in mind, 
Uh, entertain a motion. You gotta bring a motion there, Sam? What's your, what's your motion? Well, I think the uh, motion would be that uh, we approve the master plan, park plan. The master park plan is presented to be funded by the developers. Further, resolved to approve the Army Parks representatives are, are to be directed to vote in favor of the proposed Army master trail plan. All right, thank you. We have a motion to approve the master park plan. Do you have a second? I second it. I have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Uh, just w what is your timeline, Greg? Uh, September, I'd like to take it to the CSD board, and then uh, if we can get a, a action there, that would uh, shoot for late September, October parks meeting. Okay. And I think at the time, uh, Mark uh, Pekacic would like to have uh, some more public input at the parks meeting. Oh, yeah. yeah. I understand that. Yeah. And then, so then it would go from parks be submitted to the county. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Presuming it's approved of part. Correct. Does that need to be added to the motion? No. No. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. We have anything else? <coughs> All right. We have a motion and second to approve the master park plan as presented to be funded by the developers and further resolved to approve that the RMA park representatives are directed to vote in favor of the proposed RMA master trail plan at the parks committee. And I need to make just one, uh, I did have a typo in there, the word ma master park trail plan should be in there, not just Mark's, uh, master park plan. Okay, Mark, master park trail plan. Oh, yes, sir. As, as amended. Do you agree with that, Sam? As yes. Amended? Okay. And the second. Yep. All right, any other discussion? All right, hearing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passage unanimously. Thank you. Yeah, I guess if you want. Yeah, come yeah. on up. Come on up. What the heck? It's open mic night. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg gets over here to continue with the meeting. Go ahead. Only if you have a guitar. <laughs> you guys have lots of repeat people coming back up tonight. So piece of cake. So, so, so my question is, um, you know, now that we we're making the the park system official or the trail system official, correct? Um, we're not really making it official tonight. Correct. We're in part this of the process to make it official. Ultimately, no matter how much we make it official, it goes to the county, and the county right. gets to tell us what, what's official. Right. Yeah, official. no, that makes sense. So, okay. so my question ultimately is: up until this point, a lot of the um, a, a lot of the <laughs> dirt trails have been maintained by volunteers. You know, Roger and crew and others. Is there a plan long term for having this be part of? Of you know, RMA or part of our that's RMA North property. Well, you want to talk about the trail maintenance and all that, Greg? Since actually, if it's adopted as part of the exhibit E, uh, we would ask that the trails be uh, the trails should be deeded to the Ranch and Marietta Association either th th through an easement or its property. And so, the mechanism would probably be that those an easement would be granted for those trails for those dirt trails, and then RMA would be responsible for the maintenance of them. Okay, that is awesome, and that is a super important point, which I'm glad I came up here and asked because I don't know if anyone is, is aware of that. Well, just understand right now that a lot of those trails are on private property. Correct. So, so how they're maintained or who does it, whether it, they even have approval from the, the landowner themselves. Yeah. So, so our concern is really the association access of association members and that type of thing so but we have incorporated a whole bunch of that yeah and ultimately the root of my question is this sort of solidifies that once this gets through the process right Correct. that these trails will be here to stay and not necessarily be dissolved as has potentially been issues in the past and we're looking for volunteers to maintain it. <laughs> awesome <laughs> All right. have your name again <laughs> Uh, Patrick and, and you know I, I, I thought about going down that road I just haven't uh, stepped up to that so yeah you guys say right there, I know yeah he's apparently he's and, and Mr. Sullivan back there apparently there apparently Patrick's the only other summers that's not in the audience tonight. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys for the all right thank, thank you, you. Thank let's you. if we can let's move on uh, okay. to the green greens park update yes uh I put in this report that approximately two thirds of the concrete has been poured, and that actually that second pour won't happen until later this week, later this week or first of next week. Uh, we lost some days last week because of the high temperatures. They didn't want to put the concrete down, afraid it would set too fast, and and they would end up with a bad pour. Uh, and likewise, they're looking at some temperatures on Thursday of 98 degrees, and so they're they're not wanting to pour Thursday like they initially planned either. 
Uh, but I, the, the project's moving along nicely. Um, we've got the, uh, the concrete being poured, uh, the irrigation, all the main lines, and, and uh, all the uh, other lines have been put in place. Just the wait for the valves to go in and for the uh, heads to be put on. That won't happen until final grading's done. And so, uh, like I say, the park's on schedule for probably a September park opening. Great. Thanks, Greg. That's the end of your and, report. And, I, and Greg, real quick, uh, well, thanks for the tour uh, a few weeks back. Uh, it was good to see uh, all that work being done and uh, look good out there. You're going to have a ribbon cutting? <laughs> Hot dog. We had a line. ribbon cutting to, oh, to start construction. Yeah, you weren't that there, was Sam. the start. <laughs> I want to finish. There you go. <laughs> So I can bring out the, I like those presidential scissors, by the way. That's pretty <laughs> cool. Um, all right, committee activities. Uh, Cheryl, first up, Finance Committee. The Finance Committee did not meet. We just didn't spend very much money this month, did we? That's good. <laughs> Keep it that way. No big trucks or anything. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Brock and I left work harder. So that new car I got, I wanted to spell notions. It doesn't come from the RMA. <laughs> <laughs> right. So next month you're buying fish? Is that? Okay. Carp. <laughs> Carp or cheap. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Cheryl. Uh, Sam, Architectural Review Committee. Okay, the Architectural Review Committee met a couple times since our last meeting. And uh, at those meetings, we uh, did several driveway parking variance hearings. Uh, we uh, had a, another rather lengthy discussion regarding trash enclosures for Rancho Marietta. Uh, that's still an ongoing issue. We had uh, approved some re-roofs, some preliminary house plans, and had a discussion about a late start on a construction uh, timeline. And uh, we've got uh, three lease, uh, common area lease, that we need to prove it on. They're all a change of ownership and all of the uh, required fees have been paid through escrow. So my motion is to approve the existing common area lease for, and I'll put it all in one uh, motion here, common area lease for lot 1592 Lot 1694 and lot 1911. Uh, these are all existing and there's no changes except for ownership. All right, we have a motion to approve the common area lease agreements for lots 1592, 1694, and 1911 due to change of ownership. Do we have a second? A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any comments? Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Passes unanimously. Anything else, Sam? Here, take this too. Sam, I have a comment for you. Um, the, again, the subject of the trash cans and the appearance in the driveways. Uh, some months ago, uh, I, you had a, a, a comment that uh, we were preparing uh, several different plans that people could use and just pick up uh, and not have to submit plans to enclose the trash cans. Uh, how, where, where's that uh, operation stand and is it available? Is those plans available? And okay. Uh, we have, what do we have, Mark, uh, three or four different designs that we came up with that were relatively as inexpensive as we can make them. They start at about 350 to $400 to make one of these things. He's kidding. Anyway, uh, we're trying to get one of your uh, residents over there that lives in, I think it's a fourplex, where there's almost no way to put a trash enclosure in the two center ones. And so we're, we're trying to get something together with that individual, but if you wanted to, to look at some plans, if uh, you wanted to come in and see Mark, we put those together, I don't know, two or three years ago, and uh, 
because of some issues, particularly with the townhouses. Uh, I'm, we've not come up with a, a way that would be something that wouldn't stick out, maybe like a sore thumb uh, for a trash enclosure, unless they put them on a back patio or something. And then you'd have to wheel them out. It, it would be rather cumbersome, so we're, it's kind of like one of those sleeping dogs. You're not sure you want to wake it up. Uh, and, and my comment may bounce over into compliance here a little bit, but there's been an awful lot of discussion on Coretta and some of these other areas over here about, about that exact item of center units in a, in a fourplex or a threeplex not having the space to do anything. And uh, some of them have, some of the comments I've heard, uh, I, I went, I've gone to a couple of MTI meetings lately and that was probably the mistake, but um, for multiple reasons, but there was a lot of people complaining that they have tried going through our procedure of either compliance or our uh, review and not had any success in, in solving this issue of of driveway problems and 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 I I actually wrote down their addresses and went to every one of them and I think with a little bit of creativity you could figure out a way to put a trash enclosure on every one of them <laughs> we're looking for a lot of those ideas <laughs> well or I any mean, of those ideas I, 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 think, I think people think that, a, that if you have a two driveways and you need a trash enclosure opening into one driveway, and on the other side, a trash enclosure opening onto the other driveway. Those are easy. And, and yeah, and that, that's not true. They can they can be in line. That's easy for that one. <laughs> but when you have a fourplex over there, there's really no... Right. No, I, I know some of them are going to be a little more challenging than others. But they were also told, and I think this is where we bounce into compliance, they were also told that, that the fire department will not allow people to put their trash cans inside the garage anymore inside of their garage. You can't put your garbage or your uh, green waste. You can put your recycle. Yeah, okay. So, so this, this is where the problem is that they wind up leaving them in the driveway or exposed on the street and then all their neighbors complain. So I, 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 it, it may fall back into our responsibility of trying to figure out a solution here. Uh, one of your residents came to our meeting, and we and so, Mark, do you have some input? Well, I'm going to talk. We've got 198 townhouses. We have 198 townhouses, and we have probably 75 to 80 different designs, all with problems. They were all originally designed without any space for trash cans whatsoever, because all the trash cans were in the ground. Most of those townhouses were built. And so you have an inherent problem. Sure, we could probably come up with designs, but to do them economically, so they actually tie to the design of the actual structure that's built there, it's going to cost too much money to tie them so they look like the wall. Otherwise, they're going to look like an appendage, which in many cases we do have some that way. Uh, I came up with a lot of different scenarios. But that one scenario may only work on one set of townhouses. Sure. I'll have to do something else to, to address another condition that we will have. We have duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes. And all of those are very tight. And if you go back to Unit 1A, when they did the reversion to acreage and modified the square footage of the townhouses, they only made the problem worse. They didn't actually address trash cans at that time either. They totally uh, overlooked that 100%, so there really isn't anything for them to do except an appendage on the exterior of the house somewhere. Yeah, possibly between the driveways, uh, possibly on the exterior unit on the side, but the center unit is always going to be the toughest one to deal with because no matter what you do, unless it ties to the design of the actual townhouse, it's going to look like an appendage. My, so my, it is a challenge, and it's going to be a continual challenge to deal with. Sure. So. We, but we, I, I just I brought it up because I think it's going to be a, uh, an issue that's going to come before us more and more. Oh, yeah. oh I, it's been before us. It's not going away. That's, that's now, there sure. are individuals who are addressing it independently, and you know, one or two or three or however many we've had come through have done their own, and you did 
did yourself on your particular uh, unit. Um, and that's usually the way we've done it over the years. We've done it with individuals one at a, one at a time, not trying to basically mass, uh, a mass solution uh, for the trash cans. I, the, I, the other component, Larry, for from compliance is we're aware of it, um, and we usually work with those folks to do the best they can. So it's it's more of an issue. The trash cans have stayed through the weekend into the beginning of the next week, as opposed to at least getting it up near the house somewhere on the driveway. What what is MTI's responsibility, if any, to help in creating a solution? None. No. no. So I said, we, if any. But 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 the 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 residents were addressing the problem to MTI because they actually felt frustrated Bless that we weren't doing anything to help them. Sure. Well, we we just like we got it down at like as low as like three hundred fifty bucks for something that was would be not an eyesore. That's about as low as we could get it. But if you wanted to do on some of those center things, where you would actually have to build uh, something stucco that would fit into the building that would uh, it, it, it could cost several thousand dollars to put something like that in place and it's like do we want to impose that kind of requirement uh, I you know I, I was above my pay grade I, I, su I suggested they do the same thing my grandfather did go out in the backyard and dig a ditch <laughs> um, <okay. laughs> all right okay. that works in Iowa <laughs> yeah, in Arkansas. <laughs> and in Arkansas. <laughs> Arkansas. <laughs> All right, anything else? Y'all done with your report then, Sam? I'm through, thank you. All right, uh, Cheryl, Communications Committee. The Communications Committee did not meet. Would you do Were something? Were you here? Do we have any communications? <laughs> there you go. Brandon, do you have anything you want to report? Or? But Brandon might have something to say. Do you have anything? No, Brandon? No? But I will say, let me, since we're on communications, let me say um, I received my bill from, and this isn't a complaint, Brandon, but I received my bill from, but other people in the community may be, be finding this too. Um, I, I received my bill for August from Greenfield, and much to my surprise, it was up 58% or something like that from the previous month for cable. But it turned out uh, I have a, I, I, I subscribe to a, the Advanced the Dish products, and they, I was also being charged for Greenfield Basic, a quick email to, and then a telephone call with Hector down at, at Greenfield uh, indicated it was a mistake in their billing, and that's been corrected. I want to go forward. So I would encourage any members uh, that believe that they they're being incorrectly billed for the basic plus another product to call <laughs> call the billing department or, e or email them and, and at least in my experience it was taken care of within 15 minutes in fact I emailed them at 9:30 on a Friday night thinking nobody was there and I got a call back at 9:55 so <laughs> so it, wor it worked out well and and I trust it'll be straight going forward and I think so. the transition to, to your uh, expanded coverage for basic is was very smooth. So well, that was great. Yeah. So anyway, just so if people are aware, there is a remedy, and don't hesitate to contact Greenfield. I've right. got one issue, and that's the uh, the telephone system. Both uh, Sam and Bob pretend they can't hear me when I call. So <laughs> <laughs> can, can can you check with your guys to see if they can figure out what's going on? With those? I don't think they can no, deal with selective they, hearing. It, no, it's worse than that. And they, I can't hear them when I call. They can hear me yelling and screaming, but I can't hear them. You so. just hear a dial tone from me, Sam. <laughs> no, if your phone's not ringing, that's me calling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else on communications? I take notes since you didn't have a meeting. Uh, I did think of, um, Brandon, I understand there was a, a, a bit of a problem with your um, <laughs> with with uh, your um, being able to just dis dispense materials at the ETC concert on Saturday. Oh uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think I might have uh, not gotten that information to the right people. So we'll let's talk and we'll see if we can get that straightened out for you in the future. Appreciate it. Um, and I guess for those who don't know, we added uh, additional 30 plus channels uh, at the beginning of the month and. 
if you have Greenfield Basic, just scan your televisions and they'll pop in, such as like Fox Sports 1, Hallmark, Hallmark Movies and Mysteries, so on and so forth. So. You have to NFL. scan to get those? Yeah, the additional channels. Uh, if you have a, a receiver, they automatically come in. Um, <clears throat> we also have, uh, if you just have basic TV or your cable screwed to the back, yeah, just scan your television and the additional channels will appropriate there. So okay. the TV probably uh, scans up to 100 channel 128 currently. It'll go up to 160, and yeah, that's where all the new channels are. And then I noticed we're out of uh, guides up here, so I'll bring some more in tomorrow. Easy enough. We'll, we'll have Anna Lee do it. Don't worry. About it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. You don't want to go there. Thanks, Brandon. Anything else? Is that it? All right. Uh, uh, Tim, Compliance Committee. Thank you. Uh, unlike. Uh, previous uh, director, we, we had a meeting <clears throat> with our uh, committee, um, and you can <laughs> see kind of some of the activities. A couple things I do want to point out. Um, Careful, governing docs is coming up next. Oh, you want to revise in yeah. <laughs> your remarks. Uh, I, I want to commend staff, uh, and uh, I, I usually don't single out people, but I will. Uh, this goes to uh, Denise and some other folks uh, that are in the office. We've had some transitional issues with uh, CSD and security, um, and uh, two points to that. One, uh, we've had very frank discussions, uh, as we did the other day with the general manager, about some security issues and the interim security chief. Uh, I've met with the general manager. Uh, he asked for it, uh, or asked for the meeting. Uh, gave very specific concerns that RMA had, uh, very earnest discussions from that standpoint. Uh, but in lack of what's been going on for approximately the last several months, uh, it has caused uh, quite a bit of, of staff time. Uh, you've heard me talk about the available capacity that we have as, as staff. Uh, well, I'm talking to that, Rod, to you and your crew. Uh, we have that available capacity. You can see where CSD may not have, uh, but, but it's not an ever-ending available capacity. But in the short term, staff has done extremely well for us, so I just wanted to point that out. A uh, couple of things. Um, as you look at the, the notice of uh, citations, it is still speeding in stop signs. Uh, and uh, we are working with CSD interim security uh, Chief to address those specific issues. So I think we're going to have a better game plan for the end of this calendar year starting into uh, the next uh, calendar year. The other thing I want to get out to residents, because uh, you can see we had several appeals by letter, RMA staff uh, does not target residents. Um, some residents might come to the surface. Uh, it's not because we're looking for them, it's because their names have to come to the surface. So with that said, um, that is uh, my compliance report. All right, thanks, Tim. Uh, governing Docs Committee, that's my committee. We did not meet this month because we have no governing docs that needed to be reviewed. Whatever. <laughs> you're not the only working? Yeah, yeah, we're busting our ass. Sam. <coughs> After your long uh, hiatus there, Mr. Summers, it's about time to get back to work. Well, that didn't count. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been otherwise occupied with fish, with security, with a whole list of issues. So I have not been uh, not busy the last couple weeks. Um, all right, anyway, uh, maintenance committee. The uh, maintenance committee did not meet this month. <laughs> Holy Toledo. <laughs> We spent we spent all of our money last month. Yeah, yeah. They were having a fish fry over the weekend. <laughs> That's right. We were busy. We're busy. Yeah, all right. Nominate. And we saved you guys some too. Okay. Nominating committee. We have the need to do the point nominating committee members. I have a guy in mind for that. <laughs> Better not be me. <laughs> All right, we, uh, we need to approve a board member to chair the nominating committee. Typically, directors whose terms are expiring but have the option of running again are not appointed as nominating committee chair. 
Uh, my my position, uh, Director Maybes and Director Summers' terms will expire on November 30th, uh, 2017, and we cannot uh, run for election again. So maybe never. the community's happy. Never, never ever, ever again. Um, so we're not eligible to run for any additional terms ever again, unless the CCNRs are amended. Uh, having said that, I will make the motion myself to with his acceptance to appoint uh, Tim maybe uh, as chair of the nominating committee. I'll take it. Uh, I second that. Okay. Wholeheartedly. I we, you have a, uh, we have a motion and second then to... Can we discuss this? Yeah. Uh, to approve him, so any discussion I just, I just want I just, I'm just wondering, Tim, what are you going to do with all your free time when, you, when you're when you done here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have, I have some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't uh, one of them. <laughs> It's going to continue to raid my garage first. There, there you go. All right, that was my discussion point. Okay. All right. Uh, so I have a motion and a second to appoint uh, Tim as chair, chair of the nominating committee. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. And then we don't have to pick other members now. He'll think, come back to us next month. I think maybe he voted no. All right. Uh, Second item uh, is appointment of inspector of elections. Uh, we must uh, appoint an inspector of elections for the for the annual <coughs> meeting and the board of directors of the board election. Um, it's recommended, I guess, from staff that the board of directors appoint Ken Poole and Richard Silvis as uh, Dick Silvis as inspector of elections for the upcoming annual members meeting and election of directors. Uh, the bylaws require that the Board of Directors appoint a director of elections or an inspector of elections in connection with the election of directors at the annual members meeting. The duties of the director of elections include chairing the tabulating committee and resolving any uh, questions that may arise pertaining to the election. Uh, Mr. Silvis has served as inspector for many years, does a fabulous job, I should say, and uh, we're glad he's willing to continue doing it. So do we have a motion to appoint, uh, I guess, Ken Poole and, and Dick Silvis as inspectors of election? I, I still make the move. Okay. Well, Alex motion. B, you do it. Go, you want a go second? Yep, yep. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we'll call Larry's uh, motion a second. So we have a motion and a second to approve uh, appointment of inspectors of elections. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, last but not least, Recreation Committee, Alex. Maintenance? Or maintenance? No, maintenance. No, maintenance no, they didn't meet. We didn't meet. They didn't meet. That's what I said. It's just you Bob. and me. Yeah, we're busting around. You're in everybody. Yeah. Let's get parks in. Bob. You got parks in. Before you, go on. Before you go on, we have a comment from... Uh, so the applications to run for a board position are available in the lobby. The deadline for filing is September 13th. So those packages are available. And I would highly encourage, we had a eager group out here tonight wanting to be involved. I yeah, we should have had those applications out I'm, sure people up and I'm sure there's three out there somewhere. So, so it is a voluntarily run community and without the volunteers and without people running, it doesn't function. So please get out there and, and if you've been thinking about stepping up, step up and, and now's the time to do it. Did you say September? What? What was the date in September? 13th. September 13th. Okay. All right. Uh, Alex, Recreation Committee. Well, thank you. Um, so the Recreation Committee did indeed meet. Oh, easy. Uh, <laughs> we got nothing personal. We weren't the only ones. We met a couple of weeks ago. And um, just a couple of things. Uh, we, we, we were able to review... Um, uh, kind of the activities of the 4th of July and uh, we, we are certainly happy to hear any any of the public's comments uh, I want to congratulate the community for for uh, for how they you know how the, how the whole parade and how the whole uh, 4th of July went off and thank staff for their work on what they did um, appreciate all that uh, we thought it went really well but you know we want to hear any other feedback um, from the community and uh, the committee did give feedback uh, that evening and and they thought that things went well so um, very good uh, we also um, took some proposals uh, or listened to some event proposals um, from community members um, 
including a Pilates class that's, that's going to be starting up. So, Tim, if you're interested in a little, a little of that action, you can, you can get that going. I, I do wow. have a question uh, wow. about the Pilates yoga class. Uh, at least some, some, <laughs> some concern, some question. Is this a, is this a voluntarily activity? Is it a business activity? What, what exactly is being planned here? Because I have some concerns, I guess, if it's a business. So it yeah. falls under the member services program that the Recreation Committee does. And anybody that wants to do something like that, it has to be approved by the committee. They have to, the person that's proposing it has to provide insurance, have a waiver that um, releases them and RMA. And then um, they need to pay 20, RMA 20% 20 of what they take in. Okay. So how does, I maybe excuse my ignorance here, but how does this differ from us denying the yogurt ladies the ability to use common area to sell their yogurt with their frozen yogurt with the cart? It's a, it's a service that the rec com committee has to approve and it has to be open to the entire membership. I'm still, Equally. I guess, not seeing the difference, but maybe there is a um, difference. Business is a business, it seems to me, whether RMA gets a cut or not. When, yeah, when this is was it? a freebie, the way <laughs> I read this. When are they going to do it, and what's, what, has it already been set up, the schedule? Or? I'll have to get, get her schedule. So. Mm -hmm. I'll have to get her schedule. She hadn't planned that at the time. I mean, I'm not against the, the, the activity per se. It just strikes me as somehow we're being inconsistent here when we deny people the right to sell frozen yogurt in a cart, saying our CCNR is prevent it. Yeah, we're somehow carving out an exception for. There's for there's probably yoga. a, a so difference between. Karate classes. Well, I don't know, I, but uh, there's probably something against vending door to door. Vending. Well, the CCNRs the prohibit business product, activity. Selling a product as opposed to a service. Well, I don't. Know. I don't know. I'm just asking. I'm just saying that. Is the, the, the. I guess I'd like to see some more info on it. It just seems seems. I'm not against doing the activity, it just seems inconsistent from our prior positions when we've been presented with business activities. Yeah, but could they use this building for a business? Yeah, no, a it's a member service. Yeah. It's the same setup that I just described to Bob. Yep. I don't know. I don't anyway. Anyway. There's a free class I can understand for members, but I... Uh, hmm. You've got painting, you've got all kinds of stuff. Those are paid classes? Right. The, the martial arts classes are, yeah. yes. But he pays us rent. Doesn't he pay rent to use our facility? Yes. Yeah. It's the same thing with her. Oh, so she's paying rent to use the yes. 20%. Yes. 20%. Yes. Yes. So if the frozen yogurt people wanted to pay 20% or pay us rent to set up shop at Sternhouse Park, that would be, and recreation approved it, that would be okay? Not exactly. <laughs> I guess why not? I guess I, I'm not understanding because just because one's a service and one's a product. I mean, I don't see where. Well, uh, that's not providing recreation. There's nothing much recreational. I don't know. Ice cream, <laughs> ice cream isn't recreation. <laughs> okay, I guess you like ice cream better than yoga. Thank you. A lot. I like, I like yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't see the difference, but apparently there is one. So. <laughs> well, would you like me to get back to you next month? We yeah, well, I'd like to at least some background okay. on it and figure it out. But, um, but it does seem to uh, give, you, give you a clear definition. Um, I, I don't have anything else. And uh, I know we sent a, a group to the baseball game uh, a couple weeks ago. And, um, so did that. But I think that's about it. If you have nothing else, then The magic number to eliminate the Giants was seven games as of last night. Be eliminated. Be eliminated, but only, only 37 and a half games out last time I looked at the standings. Not that I check or anything. And, and have how many games left? 37. <laughs> 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 That's nicely eliminated. <laughs> That's okay. Plenty of time for the Dodgers to collapse. Come on, <laughs> Um I would like to thank Rod and, and the rest of the staff for the weekend. Uh, again, I talk about available capacity, and, and uh, we, we have a limited amount of it, but you guys demonstrated 
what the association is, is capable of, of doing. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rod, for your extraordinary efforts. I, I'll second that. Right. Anything else? If not, uh, our next meeting will be Tuesday, September 19th, uh, 2017 at 6.30 p.m. here in the RMA building. And without objection, we're adjourned. Thanks, Chief. You're welcome. I really don't get the bit the yogurt and the cologne. That's our anniversary. Actually, where is that? He's the action. I just came right over yeah, and said, I don't know. This is the joke. I thought it was a joke. Yeah, they came up and they can't, well, I don't know, but they can't before the board and stuff. And I said it was against the right? and oh, oh, You can't yeah. do it here. Or, well, let me get they wanted to sell up a stone house. So now I want to stay after that. The same thing with like the food trucks. They were that I said, well, the food trucks are part of the charitable. I'm sure. I'm going to take it over here at Dan Lee. I really? I looked at it. I thought it was a joke that you put in. It's under the minutes. Oh, yeah. In the middle of